Scott Birkin is a best-selling author and popular speaker on creativity, culture, and technology. Um, he's written seven books. A couple of them are bestsellers, like The Year Without Pants, The Myth of Innovation, and Confessions of a Public Speaker. He's been featured in some popular uh, art, uh, magazines and stuff, like The Wall Street Journal, The Economist, and Forbes. And he's the MC and speaker for Seattle Ignite. And so without further ado, let's uh, give a warm, warm round of applause for Scott. Thanks, man. In 1884, two young entrepreneurs, engineers by trade, decided to pitch and propose a, a project, a technological project, that would change the world. Now, in 1884, given how far back in history that is, the hot technology of the day were not cloud computing or mobile web application design. If you were a young person who was ambitious and had skills and were interested in engineering and using technology to make the human condition better, the field you would be working in would be construction. Now, for us, we think of construction as really boring. It's people with hard hats and backhoes. But in 1884, this is the rise of the industrial age. This is the rise of railroads and telegraphy and telephones. It was also the rise of industrial age for, for construction. At the time, in 1884, most buildings in the world were not more than a few stories high, five or six stories high, because the technology at the time, the tools at the time, the materials were stone. And stone is not reliable at scale. Generally speaking, it's not affordable at scale beyond a certain height. So these two young men in Paris, France, Cochelin and Nuget, they came up with a proposal for how to use iron, wrought iron, which was a relatively new tool and technology for the age to construct what would be the largest building in the world. Now, as all of us would do, if we were in a similar situation, we had similar ambition, we had an idea, we had a skill set, we put together a plan or a proposal. We want to pitch people on that idea. So that's what they did. And this is what their pitch looked like. They drew on paper the design for this building. And for those of you who've ever been to Paris or France, this looks kind of familiar now. One thing they did in this pitch, this is my first bit of advice for you, is the grander the idea is that you are pitching, the scarier it is for people you are pitching to. You're asking them to think in a bigger scale or take a larger amount of risk. So the first bit of advice I can give you from my first story here is that whenever you're pitching something grand, you need to find a way to tell a story about it that ties it back to things people already know. So in this little diagram here, on the margins, they were smart enough to put to scale seven, six or seven of the other tallest buildings in the world that had already been constructed. So on the bottom or in the right corner, that's Notre Dame. On top of it's the Statue of Liberty, and on and on it goes. It hap so happens, the good, one of the good fortunes these two young men had is they were employed, they worked for a man named Eiffel. Eiffel, one of the other contributions he had made before the Eiffel Tower, was working on the Statue of Liberty. So the, I think they were trying to say in here, hey, you could build something seven times grander than this other thing that you worked on. Now, as much as I'm highlighting the quality of their pitch, the bad news is that this pitch failed. Eiffel was like, eh, it's tall, but it doesn't really do anything. It's kind of like stunt technology. It's the tallest or the fastest, but so what? It doesn't solve a problem. And also, from Eiffel's point of view, it's not even really that interesting to look at. So they rejected the pitch. But Eiffel, to his credit, didn't tell him to stop working on the idea. He was like, you guys are passionate. By the way, I'm paraphrasing here. This is not literally what Eiffel said. Okay? He's like, hey, guys, you know, I'm not into it, but you guys are passionate about it, so, so keep working. And they did. They took his feedback to heart. They realized they needed another element to the design to make it reach Eiffel standards. So they got a third architect involved, a third engineer named Savastra. If you think of the final design of the Eiffel Tower, the, the bottom has those beautiful arches. Savastra contributed that design idea. So all the lattice work and the fine patterns and what looks sort of like an application of the golden ratio, how the shapes of all these little windows have this nice feel to them that draws your eye in and makes you want to keep looking at it. That was Savastra's contribution. They put together a new pitch and proposal, and they brought that back to Eiffel. And as of course we all know, this story has a happy ending. Yay, the Eiffel Tower exists. And it's probably the most popular building in the world that people pay to go see. Certainly one of the most popular buildings in history. 
Now, I tell you the story, I know where I am, I know I'm at Google, I know I'm talking about technology that's more than 100 years old, but I'm here because of a mission. One of my missions, which is that we discount the value of history and what we can apply from lessons from history, things that happened in the past, the situations and problems we're trying to solve today. And this book that I just wrote called The Dance of the Possible, one of the things about it is a lot of the stories I tell about how to solve modern problems with working with ideas come from the past. Now, history is often maligned in the tech sector, but part of what we know about how all of our brains work is that whenever you are making a decision or you're doing anything actively today in the present in your life, guess what is driving your thinking? History. Your history from last week, your history from the meeting you had yesterday, your history from what you learned in school. All of our decision making is based on history or our ability to pull lessons out from what we've already experienced. So with that in mind, my first lesson for you from the book is that all ideas are made from other ideas. That all ideas, every idea, every concept, every product, every methodology, every philosophy is comprised of other ideas that came from somewhere else. So I'm going to ask you to indulge me for a moment. I want you all to say this sentence with me when I say so. OK, you're going to do it for me? I think so. Good, OK. So on the count of three. One, two, three. All ideas are made other ideas. Very good. You sound like a little cult. This is good. <laughs> Performing a little idea cult. Fantastic. Now, in the abstract, of course, intellectually, we all know, yeah, of course, all ideas are made from other ideas. Every mathematical formula comes from other formulas. Every bit of scientific progress is based on things that were sorted out before. That's not really what I mean here. What I mean here, and the, uh, the application of this that makes it useful, is that we come across ideas or products or notions that we have so much respect for that we forget this about them. And the Eiffel Tower is an interesting example. How many of you have, have ever seen before that sketch, the original sketch of the tower? No one. This is one of the most significant buildings in the history of the world, most popular buildings. But somehow we just forget that it had a backstory and a history, that someone had to pitch it and it got rejected. And they had the fortitude and the, the, the grit to keep going, that incorporate and collaborate with other people, that all the stuff contributed to this thing that we take for granted today. So the lesson here, the advice is, whenever you are stuck, you're working on a problem, and it could be a mathematical problem, it could be an engineering problem, and you are stuck. It probably means you're forgetting this lesson. Because when you're stuck, you don't see any other way to go. But if you stop and say, wait a second, I'm stuck on this problem. All ideas are made from other ideas. What is this thing I am working on comprised of? What are the component parts? Let me step back and go, OK, there's this algorithm, this thing, this bit of UI. OK, let me take it apart. Now I have these six pieces. But well, what happens if I order them in a different way? Or I take two of them and I add some new thing to it? Now all of a sudden, you're not stuck anymore. Now by combining things, you're not guaranteed to have a good idea but you will be back in the state of progress where you are still exploring and experimenting to learn more about the problem that you are trying to solve. Now, before I continue this lesson, my name is Scott Birkin. Nothing I am sharing with you up here today is confidential. I am not a Google employee. So you are free to take pictures, post on Twitter. That's my Twitter handle. All of my books and anything else about me, including my email address, should you have a question that we didn't have time for Q&A today, just go to scottbirkin.com and everything is there, including free chapters from the book. That said, let's get back to all ideas being made of other ideas. So what you see here, so Eiffel is only known really in most of the Western world for one product, for one thing, the tower, the Eiffel Tower. This is one of the first buildings that Eiffel worked on, one of his first projects. And by comparison, it is not so exciting. It's just a square box girder bridge. And it's workmanlike, it functions, I mean, it's reliable. It was built to have trains go across, which again, this was a new technology of the day. A lot of people were very scared of trains, so building this really stable and robust looking building was probably a good design criteria. But there's nothing that exciting about this building. This building doesn't make it into history books unless you're someone like me that wants to go back and find out well, what they do before. But he did incorporate a whole bunch of ideas from engineering history, these grid systems for bridges. You can see wood bridges that are made out of the same truss structure, the square structure repeated over, over a span. Later on in his career, this is maybe five years or so before the Eiffel Tower project, now you can see that his ability to work with iron, with wrought iron, which is the primary medium he liked to use, has gotten a lot more detailed. Some of what Eiffel became, was, at least in his profession, was famous for was developing techniques for using wrought iron more efficiently, more effectively. So you look at this design, it starts to have some some magic to it, there's some appeal here. And a particular note to this theme of all ideas being made of other ideas, the central element of this bridge is an arch. 
An arch is one of the oldest technologies for engineering construction we have in the world. Hundreds and hundreds of years old. So he took an old idea here, but by combining it with something new he was working with, that combination, wrought iron, which had different properties for strength and tension, didn't need as much material to be just as strong, now it becomes transparent. You can see through the arch, which gives it this dynamic effect. It's not just a building anymore. It's a building that when you look at it, there's some experience you have in your brain. It's just interesting to look at. How, it almost seems like magic. And you can imagine in the 1850s and 1860s, 1870s, around the time this was built, how magical it must have been to see this use of an old idea combined with something new. We also know that he had influences, that Eiffel had thought earlier on about building a huge tower. This is the Ladding Observatory, which was a World's Fair creation in the 1950s in New York State. And this building, when it was built, was the tallest building. But Eiffel saw this and had the same complaint that he had to his two young engineers when he saw this. He said, it's tall and it's impressive, but it's basically built to serve an abstract, egotistical function. It's just the tallest building. And you could argue, in a way, that when he saw this building in the 1850s, many years before he'd get pitched on the tower idea, a problem space was created in his mind. That building a tall tower was not enough, but there could be some other kind of tall building that would satisfy what he thought was the good use of a technologi technological innovation. A more local notion or example for ideas being made of other ideas is this famous drawing by da Vinci. Anyone know the name of this drawing? Vitruvian Man, very good. So Vitruvian Man, that's the name of this drawing. And when we hear that, Vitruvian Man, we go, oh, Vitruvian Man must be like the dude in the drawing. Like maybe it was like Da Vinci's neighbor or, or the model. It's the name of the model that he hired. No, Vitruvian is a reference to Vitruvius. And Vitruvius was a Roman architect who lived thou a thousand years plus before Da Vinci was even born. And Vitruvius wrote a book. That book is called The Ten Books on Architecture. Now, many of you are engineers or designers or project managers. We like to think that our industry, design patterns, that we've conceived of this notion of putting together like the, the blueprints for how these patterns that repeat in our work and, and sharing them. But Vitruvius wrote this book called The Ten Books on Architecture, and it's the first design patterns book in the Western canon. It's not about software engineering, of course, but it is about actual engineering, actual architecture engineering. And Da Vinci read a passage in this book that was about scale and proportion. And this goes back to the Greeks. This Roman guy, as many of the Romans did, took ideas from the Greeks, repurposed them. Like all the Greek god names, the Romans took the same gods, basically just put a label on them. A lot of repurposing went on in all of those traditions. But specific to this story, there's a passage in here that's purely about the human form. And it's a passage that talks about the size of your head, should be about one eighth of the size of your body, and the ratio between your, ar the rate that your, your arm length to how long your legs are. And Da Vinci read this passage and was inspired enough to say, I want to make a drawing that expresses this written idea. So that's where Vitruvian Man comes from. But Vitruvian Man is so popular because Da Vinci is so popular in our culture, this thing now is a pattern, an idea that's been reused and reused again and again and again, often without any knowledge of where the idea came from or what the meaning of it was. It's now this idea that's been reused and recombined and recombined, and recombined. And you see this pattern everywhere. Now, often ideas get reused in a way that's very ignorant. It's just this visual thing that people, oh, that's interesting. I know it's iconic. I'm not going to know what, why it became iconic. I'm just going to reuse it. But then you see things like this, where the show Westworld has the, the, a version of the Vitruvian Man in the logo. And now that you know some of the history of what this, this drawing is from and what it means, their use of this is actually very smart. They're talking about reinventing man, reinventing the idea of proportion, reinventing the idea of perfection. So in these simple notions, when you start peeling back the layers of what an idea is and you want to tear them apart, the landscape of possibilities for what you can do now gets much wider. Now to make this more practical, and more about products and creative thinking for products, the advice for you that I have is this, that if you study the history of a problem, the history of the problem, not the technology, but the problem, you'll find new ideas for trying to solve it. The history of the idea of the problem. An example that is close to home to drive this point home. Google, the first major invention back when the company started was PageRank, which I'm sure all of you are very familiar with and can lecture me about. But what I know about PageRank is that PageRank, the idea that you can find the value of one page by examining how well referenced it is by other pages, 
and extending that mathematically entirely through the network is an idea that was not invented by the founders of Google. That was an idea that was, in some sense, originated from research papers themselves. Research papers, academic papers, footnote at the bottom, all the people they are referencing in their paper. And you can build an index, and people did this. There are databases and academic sources in, in colleges that do the same thing. They see how many people reference this paper, and they build an index, find the most reference papers. So the very foundation of the company that you work for was the recasting of an idea that existed already and applied to a different medium. Instead of research papers, applied to the web. By understanding the history of a problem, you will see different ways of looking at the problem, which will invite new ideas and points of view you would never find if you didn't go back and study that history. Speaking of your competitors, Amazon is a similar story. This is an ad from the early 1900s for Sears Roebuck. And Sears Roebuck, for those of you who don't know, in the industrial age, 1890s, 1900, they were the Amazon of America. They had a book, this printed book, that contained every product available that you could possibly get through mail order. And mail order itself was a new idea. If you read their little tagline, it sounds a lot like Amazon's ads today. We sell everything by mail order only. Your money will be promptly returned if you're not perfectly satisfied. This is basically playbook out of Amazon's marketing campaign. And I tell you that not because I'm trying to convince you to go work at Amazon or anything, but if you compete with Amazon, this is another competitive strategy to use. Study the history of the problem. Some ideas were successful, but they were abandoned because the person who ran with the idea ran out of money. Or that industry for a time took a, took a big hit. The whole industry did. So these good ideas are sitting there for solving a problem, but they're gone. They've been forgotten. You go back, have a better view of the problem, and those ideas become yours. From a, a later catalog, 1940s, this is what basically the conversion page, the equivalent of a conversion web page, the conversion page in that catalog looked like. And if you look at this catalog design compared to like conversion pages on the web, there's some, a lot of smart stuff going on here. You have anchoring, price anchoring, using cognitive science to help figure out how to convince people to buy stuff. Value leader, you have zoomed in versions of the, the, guitar, the guitar strut. There's all kinds of ideas here that you can go back and go, wait a second, there's things we've lost in all of our progress. We've made things a lot better in some ways, but there's ideas here that could be reused and experimented with and reapplied. My second lesson for you, and I only have two more, and then we'll open the floor for questions. My second lesson for you is that great ideas often look weird at first. If you are dealing with a true a notion that is so much superior to what you are familiar with, it's not going to look normal to you. It's not going to make sense in the worldview that you have. And when you go back and look at the history of how we developed all these technologies that we now take for granted, railroads being one, the internet and the web being the second, mobile devices being third, go back and read about the first couple of years of those devices being products, and people just look at them, why would I use that for? What would that do for me? That's the common response, even if the idea is sound. So to tie this back home to the first story, when Eiffel proposed the tower idea to the Parisian World's Fair Committee, they accepted it, which well, we all know. Two things happened. One, they told them we accept it, but only at half the budget you proposed. Half the budget. Eiffel was a businessman. We like to think of it now as like an arts project. This is purely done for the beauty of the world. No, he was a businessman. So he saw this as an opportunity. He's like, fine, I'll put up the other half of the capital if I get ticket concessions. I get to sell you know, baguettes when people get inside the Eiffel Tower. I get all that money. So it was a business proposition for him first and foremost. Second, and this is the most shocking thing, they agreed on the budget. They started working. They broke ground on building the Eiffel Tower. 300 or more of the leaders of the cultural zeitgeist in Paris, which is the world leader at the time, the arts in the world, poets, architects, musicians, writers, politicians, all got together in outrage at how much they hated the idea of the Eiffel Tower. They hated it. They thought it was a rejection of all the norms of aesthetics. It was a rejection of the idea of what technology should do. 300 got together, 300 of these experts got together and wrote an essay that they made into a pamphlet. It was also published in newspapers where they basically said, we have to kill this project. I'm going to read a small passage of this to you. We writers, painters, sculptors, architects protest with all of our strength, with all of our indignation in the name of slighted French taste, which is a powerful force, slide to French taste, against this tower. 
They also called it this mass of iron gymnasium apparatus, which is pretty insulting. And all of us look at this and go, these people were so wrong. There's, they were so, how could they say this about this great work? And that's how I felt about this too when I first heard about this. But that's where this notion of good ideas seeming weird is important. Because we have to put our heads back in time. We know too much now. Go back to 1885. Tallest buildings in Paris, other than some of the churches, six stories high, five stories high. You're walking around these great promenades and parks. You're eating a baguette and some cheese, have some wine. You're walking and strolling along. And then you turn a corner and you see this. It does look kind of monstrous in that context. It does look really foreign. Iron, wrought iron, is a new technology. This is not something people are used to, used to seeing or understanding or even feeling is safe. So they saw this and that was their response. And from that perspective, it's entirely understandable. How can they conceive of why this has merit when it's the first time they've seen something like it? A more recent example, I know that I have forced all of you to go back in time to ages when there was no electricity. So I'm going to give you an example that's a little bit more recent, actually, in the time of electricity. I'm going to show you a picture of a device, a prototype, a prototype of a device that's one of the most important inventions in the last 50 years. And I want to see if you can guess what it is. So I'm going to show it to you. If you think you know what it is, just raise your hand. And again, it's a prototype, not the final version. So I saw one hand. So hold on a second. Two hands. OK, I'll make it a little bit easier. So I pulled a dirty trick on you. Uh, this picture's upside down. Does that help at all? <laughs> I'm just kidding. It was right side up before. No, I'm just screwing with you now. Actually, th this is the right way. This is the right way. So two people raise their hand. Do you have still have a guess? Anybody? Uh, initially, I thought it was Telegram, but it's too recent. So this is an electrical box. Electrical box? Yeah. Like for shock therapy or something? Yeah, like what? The thing you put in a wall. Put in a wall. OK. Other guesses? Yeah? Doorbell? Doorbell? Nope. So I'll give you a hint. This object here is a human knee. A human knee. Human knee, part of your body, your knee, middle of your leg. Prototype, OK. So I'll cut to the chase here. This is a prototype that was made by Doug Engelbart. And Doug Engelbart is the inventor of the mouse. And what he was thinking at the time, this is late 1860s, he's thinking of how do I make human-computer interaction better? How do people interact with computers and machines in 1865? Well, there's not that many devices yet. There's cars. Sorry? 19. Yeah. That would be impressive if he was working on the mouse in 1865. So in 1965, how do people interact with machines? What's the interaction models that we have? Cars. You drive with your car and you drive with your hands, you drive with your feet, foot on a pedal. So that's one mode that could be used. Also sewing machines, which is really the primary inspiration for this. Sewing machine, you work with your hands, you have a foot on the floor controlling something. So what he was thinking here, his hypothesis in this experiment was, why not use this part of your body that goes unused to do x, y pointing on the screen. Then you have two hands free. It's actually, seems, it's actually kind of a brilliant hypothesis. Even today, most of our work, we're in, trying so hard to input all this stuff into a computer, 50% of our limbs don't get used for that at all. This is fine if one of you wants to go quit Google and start a startup on you know, extra limb interface design. You're welcome to do it, because this is an old idea. But he was on the right track. He was thinking of how do people interact with machines. Eventually, he developed the, more, the model that we know, this direction. But even in 1970, 1971, if he had shown this to us, and we were alive then, not from time travel, we were alive then, and said, this is the future, we'd be like, what are you talking about? This is like a, a box on a string. The idea is expressing a whole bunch of assumptions that are foreign, and it will seem weird. The last piece of advice here to drive this home, I know a lot of this is history, and my promise to you is to apply history to today. So what this means is all of you are in meetings when you're working on products, you're trying to solve something, you're building something, where you're discussing alternatives. There's uh, proposal A, proposal B, C, and maybe you have some criteria you're using to vet them, like user scenarios or the goals for your project, whatever. So you look at idea A in this discussion, and you say, oh, it's good in these ways. Well, that's a good idea. We'll put it in the good idea pile. Then you go to idea B, and you're like, oh, we can see already it's going to have these issues. That's going to go in the bad pile. And you go through C and D. 
Every now and then, you're going to have an idea that's proposed that you look at in these discussions and you go, that's, that's really weird. And you turn to the person who proposed it, you're like, can you explain this? And they'll probably go, yeah, that's a weird one. Like, I feel like there's something really to it that's good, but I haven't figured it out yet. And the natural thing that we do, since we're efficiency minded, we have project deadlines, we take the weird ideas and we throw them away with all the bad ideas. That's a mistake. The advice to you is to keep weird ideas around. A weird idea means you don't understand enough about the problem or about the potential of the idea to evaluate it. You can't judge it. And of course, if you're on a deadline, you shouldn't ship this idea you can't evaluate. But it also means there's probably potential in it that if you study it more, you pay attention to it, you come back to it a week later, two weeks later, your point of view is going to be different. You're going to ask different questions of it. And you might find something that leads to a discovery. Much of the history of inventors, people who get credited with inventing and discovering, a lot of what I shouldn't say a lot because this is not a guaranteed method, but there are no guaranteed methods in this sort of work. But many of their breakthroughs occur occurred because of things that were weird to them, they kept around and kept experimenting on until they found its value. And the canonical example, the story that's most well known is the post-it note. The post-it note story, as it's the cliche version, is someone had weak glue, accidentally discovered weak glue, and that's how we got the post-it note. But that's a shallow, empty story. The true part of the story, which ties all this together, yes, it's true. An engineer at 3M was working on trying to make a strong glue. And by accident, he made a weak one. But he didn't throw it away. He looked at it and go, and what was like, this is weird. And he put it aside. Then the next day, or a week later, he's like, what can I do with this? I, it's, it can't solve the intended problem, but maybe it's good for something else. And he kept it around for years. Continually trying, let me try it here, let me try it there. He'd go to his coworkers, go, hey, I have this stuff. He didn't tell them what it was designed for. Just said, hey, I got this stuff. What would you do with it? Sort of like an improv question. And he did all sorts of experiments. Eventually, one of his coworkers looked at that and said, you know what, I, maybe I can use this. Because he had a problem. He, he sang in a choir, and he wanted to put notation on the choir sheets, the music sheets. So he said, with that soft glue, that weak glue, I can possibly put something on it that I can easily take off. That's the breakthrough moment. What's often not said, it took years now of refining that product and convincing people of its value for the post note to become the product that we know today. So in summation, any story that you know of, any legendary creation in the tech sector, maybe you think the iPhone is one of the greatest things ever made. Maybe you think PageRank is a breakthrough in the history of technology. Whatever thing you think of as perfect, being this masterpiece, they all have a history where they started as experiments. And if you want to be someone who makes masterpieces or makes great things, you want to understand what that experimental part of the process was like. Because that's what you're going to have to emulate in projects that you're working on in making something today. Now my last lesson for you, purely about creative thinking and how to develop that skill in yourself, is that our minds are naturally creative. It is wired into us as part of our brain function. Anyone who is not in prison, not in a psych ward, functions in a decent way, can get to work and home, has a brain that is functioning, and creativity is part of that brain function. And the best way to illustrate this to you is a common scenario that occurs to us in everyday life, which is losing your keys. So imagine tomorrow you wake up, you're getting ready for work. Actually, let's say, let's say Monday, unless some of you are working on Saturday. Monday, you wake up, you're going to go to work, you do your normal routine, and you do your like, pre-airlock check of like wallet, purse, phone, keys, and you reach for your keys, and the keys are not there. Okay, and your brain automatically goes into first level mode, well, where are my keys? Oh, normally when I come home, I put them in the basket by the front door. Okay, so you go there, look at the basket. And if they're not there, you go, hmm, brain goes to level two. Like fault tolerance, error checking. Maybe the keys fell behind the basket, so you look behind the basket. Not there. Now your brain automatically goes to level three. Creativity starts to ensue. Without any ideation methods, any brainstorming techniques, all of a sudden, you start looking in your closet at clothes that you have not worn in like a month. You just do it. You know it's a little weird, but you're not, it, could, it could be. Somehow they could be there. When that doesn't work, you go to the next level. You probably check your pants again, somehow assuming that in the time that you've been looking, they have rematerialized where they should have been. Then you go to level four, like maybe someone broke into my house and stole them. 
But that doesn't make any sense, of course, because they would have stolen other stuff too. No, nope. maybe your cat took the, your brain automatically goes to these places. Biologically, you can't prevent it. The explanation is this is the asset that we have as a species. We're not the strongest species, we're not the fastest species, but our brains are good at solving problems and inventing experiments and hypotheses to try to solve problems. This situation is an unpleasant one. So we're motivated by a certain kind of fear. Our brains kick in in a way, even though losing your keys is not the end of the world, it does feel that way. Your, your amygdala, the fight or flight response part of your brain, is triggered in these moments. And it's not filtering out anymore. That's why these ideas can bubble up from your subconscious and you're willing to try them. Normally in everyday life, in ordinary situations, in work situations, we have lots and lots of filters we are automatically placing on what our subconscious can do. In workplaces, it's often just simply about wanting to sound smart. If you have a filter, you always want to sound smart in conversations or you want to impress your boss enough to get promoted, you're going to have a filter on things that come out of your mind or come out of your brain because you're trying to be perfect. But as we've talked about already, you have to be willing to say weird things and experiment to find the right way to go. So there's a mismatch here. Natural brain function allows these things to happen, but there's all these things and inhibitors we put on top of it that prevent it. To sum this up in a neat little phrase, when we are suitably motivated by a hard problem, creativity ensues. It just happens on its own. The two things that are important, suitably motivated, hard problem. If you're suitably motivated to solve an easy problem, the creativity stuff doesn't have to kick in. Losing your keys and if it's the first place you look, done. Our brains are lazy. Why, come, why invent all these weird scenarios? Suitably motivated by a hard problem. Now to wrap up here, I'll, I have three pieces of specific advice about creative thinking. This will be the last set of points that I make and then I'll open the floor for questions. So number one is just a summation of what we talked about before. Everything, I've everything I showed you, Eiffel's work, uh, Doug Engelbart, Da Vinci. When you look at it from a broad perspective, what were they all doing? They were all working. They had notions for things. Da Vinci was inspired by that, the, the passage he read. He had a, there was an idea there, but he got to work. He said, I want to express this idea. I'm going to try this thing out. The two young engineers had an idea, a concept. They didn't just let it sit as a concept. They got to work. They made a sketch. They made a prototype. Creativity is best thought of in the smaller form of the word, create. It's a verb. It's something that you do. In the, habit of make, in, in the process of making things, that's where creativity can be expressed. It's not some abstract thing, some abstract skill you develop on its own. It has to be done through the process of work. Second, false constraints. So what I told to you, what I said to you just a minute ago about keys and the inhibitors that we put upon our brain, our natural creative brain function, there are false constraints that we put upon our thinking. And there's a stupid puzzle that I'm going to share with you that you probably have seen before. How many of you have seen this puzzle before? A couple of you. How many of you heard the phrase, think outside the box? How many of you hate the phrase, think outside the box? Think out I want all of you to say it with me. One, two, three. OK, that was not as good as the first time. Our cult is falling apart here. I feel very bad. I, d I screwed it up. I totally screwed it up. My fault. I'd make you do it again, but I'd rather get to Q&A. So, th but this is the source of that saying, think outside the box. And the puzzle, for those of you who want to solve it for yourself, cover your ears and your eyes for like 20 seconds. No one cares. Good. The, this puzzle, you're supposed to connect all the dots using only straight lines. And so the solution to the puzzle involves you having to go outside of the box. The implicate, and it's a stupid puzzle, it's not really that important. The implication here, though, is good. It's about false constraints. The whole notion here is that no one told you in the pro solving the problem that you couldn't work outside the box. We presume it. Our, to live in society, we presume lots of constraints. When you came in this room, no one, none of you sat down up here next to me. When, none, of you, none of you were standing up in the middle of my presentation. There's all these conventions and constraints that we naturally apply to situations. That's how society and civilization work. But we're talking about creativity here. The exercise here, that you're try the message they're trying to get across in this puzzle, is if you work through a list of all the constraints you think are true, let's say you come up with seven of them, and it turns out one of those constraints is false, that's a window of possibilities now that opens up. And that's where ideas are. It's not this generative thing. It's actually reductive. Oh, if I don't have to worry about budget for this, OK, now. If I don't have to worry about schedule for this, or I have an extra week, I assume this had to be done Friday. Oh, it's Monday? Possibilities open up. So it's a logical exercise. Anytime you're stuck on a problem, make a list of the constraints that you are assuming are true. 
Show it to a coworker. Show it to your boss. They go, really? That's not the that's not the goal. The goal. You go, ah. Now the window possibilities opens up. For fun, there are many other possible possible solutions for this. Infinite, in fact. You could do it in three lines if you go really outside the box. You can do it in one line if it's a fat line. No one told you the size of the line. Uh, you could do it in one line if it goes all the way around the world and comes back around. And the more absurd you're willing to get, the more silly you're willing to get, the more solutions you can come up with. But there should be an infinite number of solutions to this. So an exercise for you could be see if you can come up with more of them. Then my last bit, my last note for you is about self-respect. So I told you, all that your brains are wired by design to be creative, that stuff is in you. Society, and as we get older and we try to get good grades and try to get good jobs and good performance reviews, constraints, we pile constraints on them, we forget that natural part of ourselves. So the best single habit to learn or practice is to have a place for yourself where your ideas can go that no one will see. And the most obvious way to do this is a journal, some kind of a journal, a book, it could be a, a Google Doc, it could be anything where you can put stuff that's in your brain, you're like, that's an interesting idea, and you can put it down and no one else is going to see it. You're training your subconscious to start talking to you again. And you're going to listen more carefully now because there's a place for it to go. Even more importantly, our memories are terrible. We have terrible memories. Once you put something in the world, there's some chance, even if it's a small chance, that, you'll, that you can come back to it and go, oh right, I can use this in my next project. But if it just goes through your mind and out your brain, you'll never see it again. So most artists, scientists, researchers keep some kind of journal. Even people who work on like curing cancer, they have lab notes. They put down their observations and thoughts habitually. They can come back later and go, oh right, I forgot about this and I thought about this four days ago. Put these two pieces together, boom, I got something new. So keeping a journal. There's an element of courage to this. Those two young engineers had to have the courage to pitch their boss in the idea. Even if you're creative and you keep a journal and you develop your ideas, there's some element of courage required because you are working into the unknown. If you're pitching something that's been done before that you know is going to work, there's not much risk there. We're talking about progress. We're talking about good ideas. We're talking about bigger ideas. There's going to be risk there. You're going to be going into the unknown. And part of what makes a good team or a good boss are people who make you feel comfortable offering up things that might not work. There's some room and margin for saying things that are weird or unexpected. Just like Eiffel offered his team, hey, I don't fully get what you're doing, but I want you to keep going and see if you can develop it further. And with that, I will end with some sparkle, razzle, dazzle of the book cover. The book is out now. The audiobook released today. It's gotten great reviews. There's lots of famous other creative people who said good things about it. And with the rest of our time, I am happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you for listening. Thanks. I'm also happy to be your like Snopes for history of inventions. It's one of my like hobbies, like the history of inventions of many, many famous things that you may know the story of that you want to know. Is that did that really happen? Like Newton and the Apple or Alexander Graham Bell. If you have any of those legends, you're like, is that really true? I'm happy to be your your um, invention Snopes. I'm sorry? Do you plan a book about those? A book about those? I, I wrote one. Uh, the Myths of Innovation is in part that book. That, uh, the book isn't anchored strictly on that. It's similar to the lecture I just gave you about these stories we think we know, but trying to use those stories to apply in real life, making decisions and building stuff. Yes, sir? So, you want to, oh, I'm sorry. There was a process. I broke the process. Yes, sir. <laughs> I was on, okay, so if all ideas are formed from other ideas, clearly there's value in exposing yourself to as many ideas as possible. I find personally, even my you know, software engineering work, I use ideas from TV shows I watch, video games, I play all sorts of things. So what are some things that you would recommend doing in your free time to expose yourself to as many ideas as possible? It's a great question. Uh, I think that the, the one thing I would say, you're, you're already well ahead of the curve. And what you're, you've, already, you've already realized that this is you see the potential in experiencing other things just, just coincidentally, you're like, oh, I can take this and use it here. And a lot of the history of breakthroughs are these sorts of stories of a pattern or a method that's well known in one field being used in another. The thing I might encourage you to do is to pick 
fields or subjects you know nothing about. Because when you go to a field or a subject you know nothing about, you're, you're, you don't have any pressure of sounding stupid. So a lot of people who want to be more inventive, they go to, and they work in the tech sector, they try to find another tech sector event that's more about invention. And I'm like, no. Like, go to an event that's about a different field, preferably one where they're inventing things, but not technological. And you will hear things and observe things that will make you curious. And that curiosity, you'll ask questions. And in asking those questions, you'll say, well, in my, when I'm, in, when I'm building something, this is how we do it. How do you do this? And those kinds of conversations now where you're comparing across fields, like, th I guess what I'm trying to say is there's probably someone just like you in the, um, the plumbing industry. Or the, you, you mentioned games, or like the, uh, you know, someone who makes board games for a living. Or someone who's like a medical engineer. The closer you can get to someone who's a parallel to you but has a completely different background, those kind of conversations are the powerful ones. It's hard to find those connections because you have to reach out across your comfort level. But again, it's about going into, into the unknown. Next question. So the, the computers that we're using today are based on technology that was invented in the 20th century. But in the 19th century, we had Boole, who did the math, and Babbage, who made the, the engine. What were those based on? What was previous technology that uh, was basically the forerunner of those computers? Sure, so that's a good question. I don't know about Boole. Uh, Boole was a mathematician, so he was probably, he would probably say there was mathematical theories and, and, and um, hypotheses he was following. Babbage, I'm sure, was influenced by clock making, for sure. Uh, at that time, the most sophisticated engineering for mechanical gear work were clockmakers. And there's a long history and tradition of that design work and engineering work. I have to believe that when he started his work, he looked at clocks first. And the gearing, I mean, just the fact of how do you make intricate gearing at that kind of sophistication, where would you look if you were, if you were alive in, 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 at that time? It had to be clockwork, for sure. Another question. Okay. Is there an interstitial question someone can ask to save your coworker? Um, you have a question. So about creativity, is it something that you can force, or are you saying maybe to carve out time daily to be creative or have ideas or journal? I think that the answer is both. <laughs> it's an unfair answer. You can force it. The, the key example is a good example of that. Like if you're really desperate, like you're going to be without again without even thinking about it, without trying to summon your creative you know gods or anything, those ideas will start going through your mind. So there is something to be said for putting yourself in situations that will test you. But the habits of it, the habits of creation, are something that you really need to do every day. That's why the journal is for. I mean, to drive the journal example to tie his question to the journal thing I was trying to say. If I have this habit for myself of I think of some notion and I put it down. I think of some notion and I put it down. And I come back a week later and I look at that notion and I go, ah, and I expand it out. My own confidence in my ability to come up with ideas and to talk to this, my own subconscious improves and improves over time. So that's like a muscle. It's like practicing anything else. But there are some situations where you're going to, some people feel most creative when they're at a deadline or when they are working on a high stress project for some people. There's no universal answer to these things, of course, because we're all different. And that's part of why I hate all these recipe books, the seven killer steps, the, the six secret you know, silver bullets, because the goal here is for you to apply your unique worldview and experiences to a problem. That's what you're trying to be when you're creative. So sort of like the joke where I made you all say at the same time, you know, all ideas come from other ideas. There can't be any universal way to do this. Part of what you have to do is to be more self-aware of your own habits and tendencies. And a lot of people are really afraid of journaling because they're afraid of what thing they will put in there. But if you're afraid of your own ideas, then you probably need to seek therapy. <laughs> now, therapy is a good thing. I'm not, I'm not, it's not a pejorative. But if really that's the inhibitor, it's got nothing to do with the world or your brain. It's your own psychology and your fear of what your brain may come up with. You can't be afraid of that anymore, which is why journaling helps so much. You get comfortable and familiar with the weird things your subconscious tends to suggest. Are you ready for your question now? Yeah, I All think right. so. So my question is, um, at the other end of the spectrum, 
um, where you constantly think of, oh, maybe I can do this. And while before you're about to do that, you're like, oh, what about this other idea? Ah, and you okay. have this infinite sort of loop about sure. new ideas. Yes. Any suggestion? For that? I, I have a suggestion, but it's similar to, let's give it, let's take this example and put it into like everyday terms. So let's say, let's say I was single and I go on a first date and I kind of like that person. Then I go on another date. I kind of like that person and I never, what would you say? I never commit. Never commit. If you never commit to something, that means that you maybe don't really want to do this thing. That all those ideas are good, but maybe you find it more fun to just play with the idea in your mind. For a lot of people, that's true. Because as I said, creativity is work. Once you say, I want to write a novel, I want to start a company, hey, it's an epiphany. It feels great over dinner and wine with your friends. I'm going to start a company. You go, yeah. Then the next day, you're like, oh, I got to like, call people, I gotta write documents, I gotta, this doesn't feel so creative anymore. This feels like work, maybe I'm doing it wrong. Go to dinner with your friends again, hey, I'm gonna make a movie. And you, you go through the same loop of confusing the fun of coming up with the idea with the reality of the work of actually putting that idea in the world. So I would say to you that it doesn't matter. All of the ideas you've come up with are probably good, good enough to put a weekend of time into them. But until you put that commitment in, you're never gonna learn enough about yourself and your own true interests, you'll just keep going along the surface. Which could be fine, but then you, could, you have to realize that that's really what you like to do rather than being someone who's committed to an idea to build it, to build something. Question? All right. So this question is stemming from my discussions with a friend about creativity. Um, so personally, in my free time, I like listening to podcasts about uh, various things. Uh, I don't like listening to music that much. For example, on my way to work, I listen to audiobooks and stuff. And according to my friend, keeping my brain this occupied even in my free time uh, may be destroying my creativity. <laughs> so do you think <laughs> that has any validity? Or <laughs> that should be the podcast, Creativity Destroyer. <laughs> listen to this, you'll never have an idea again. Yes and no. Everybody's different. And the way people relax and what makes them feel comfortable is different. So there's no universal answer. I can say, though, and there is neuroscience and cognitive psychology behind this, the why you get ideas in the shower. So every, who here has gotten an idea in the shower? Like, who here showers? Good. <laughs> All right. Excellent. What goes on there is the reason why it's become like a sacred place is that it's one of the few places where there's no screens, uh, there's no music by default. Uh, your body's relaxed, it's comfortable, and what your, your higher brain, the logical part of your brain, is quieter, and there's no input. So your subconscious, which is where all the associations between things, the source of our ideas, it's easier for ideas to bubble up. So as long as there's some time regularly for you where that's true, and it could be when you go for a walk, it could be when you're running, it could be when you're at the gym. As long as there's some state of mind that you reach where your higher brain is kind of quiet, that, that's when it could happen. And for some people listening to podcasts and stuff, I listen to the radio all the time, I listen to podcasts all the time, even at the gym. Sometimes I'm tuned in, and sometimes it's on, and my brain is somewhere else. So just the fact that that input is there doesn't mean it doesn't necessarily define what's going on in your brain. But there's lots of evidence for this. Uh, often it's physical activity where our higher brains are more quiet and the subconscious can bubble up. So for some people it's running or going for a walk or going for a hike. So you should think about what habit you have where your higher brain is idle and you're not problem solving, but there's some other passive thing that you're doing that works for you. And you'll have to experiment to find it. Yeah. We have time for maybe one or two more questions. Yes, sir? So uh, these days when we have a problem or trying to solve something, we frequently uh, go search the web or yeah. go to YouTube, how to do this, how to do that. That could be a little bit similar to what the okay. for me asked. Now, uh, here is the, uh, what, what's the right thing to do here? Now, if you, if you have a problem and you look it up, you'll, you'll solve the problem quickly, but then you, you kind of like, you block your, yourself from finding a solution yourself. Sure. But on the other hand, you expose yourself to other ideas. Mm -hmm. Now, this is good. As you said, if you expose yourself to other ideas, you will come up with new ideas. But then, if you don't try to come up with ideas, it, you see the contradiction there? I do. I don't, I, don't I, I, I guess it's, it's usually not a problem, because it, if, if you were to say, decide that you wanted to start a company, well, you Google, how do I start a company? 
And you find a list of things that you now have to go and do, like I kind of said before. Once you start going and do those things, you may realize or recognize that there's a better way to do them, or be frustrated with one of those steps, you'll seek out other ones. But most of the things you're likely to look up as ways to solve the problem are going to be very abstract. Like if you were to do a Google search for how to write a book, it's going to give you some basic construction of it, but it's not going to tell you whether to write a novel or a thriller or, or a, you know, a Victorian drama. There's always going to be a lot of space that you need to fill out yourself. And so I guess what I would say is it's very, a very practical answer is do or do the things that actually help you produce. If you produce stuff and you're like, my solutions and the things I create are really boring to me, then maybe you should think for the next project, I'm not going to research anything and experiment that way. Every project is going to be different, especially if you're trying to do ambitious work. Every project is going to be different. And it's going to demand different things of you. It's going to require different techniques or skills to try. So there's no universal answer, unfortunately. And that is the case for a lot of these questions. A common question I get asked is, how do I know when I'm done? How do I know when I'm done? And I'm like, have you ever consumed something like a movie or a software product or a book, and you're like, this is terrible, yet you paid money for it and it exists in the world? Well, that's a finished stuff, many people think, isn't very good, is not done. I'm sure you have arguments with your coworkers. They're like, we need to ship this today. And you're like, no, this is terrible. It's got all these bugs and problems. It's inherently debatable. How, when is it done? Inherently debatable. And the way you solve those discussions or is with a group of people, is some consensus on what the criteria is for actually shipping something. And you do that with yourself. Is this essay good enough to publish? I don't know. Is this tweet good enough to tweet? I don't know. Some people spend time reviewing them and they put them in their drafts folder. Other people, you can tell, just go blah, blah, and put, push the button. <laughs> right? So is one right, is one wrong? Some of those people who just don't really think about it much have a lot of followers. Some people were very precious and care a lot about high quality, don't have many. Popularity is unfair and not based on a set criteria that we all agree on. And that's part of the world you enter when you're doing creative work. Eiffel Tower, lots of people at the time hated it. Were they right? Were they wrong? Depends on your point of view and perspective. And the more creative the work you're doing, the more subjective the ways to evaluate it will be. So one more? Yes, sir. Excuse me. <laughs> okay. Uh, so in education, there's been a big push towards preparing kids for the future, whatever the jobs of the future are. And so my own kids, I see them being pushed in science, math, computer programming. You mentioned history at the beginning. Yes. Are there things you would like to see done differently in education in light of Yes, education? yes. I think that every student everywhere should be, should get five copies of this book <laughs> and five for each of their parents and that would solve everything. The creativity answer, and there's a lot of, I'm not an expert on this, but the, and I'm not, a, I'm not particularly a fan of Montessori schools, but the notion that they have of self-directed things seems like the right path to me. That part of, in this conversation, how do you decide? How do you, it's self-oriented. That there's less and less room for that, it seems, like in most curriculums and the assumptions we have about what people should learn. And so programming could be that. If the goal isn't simply to memorize how to code, but the goal is to learn how to make your own stuff. That the goal is to every quarter, every week, you've built something. And you had your criteria for it, and you evaluated it, and you, you decide for yourself what is good. That kind of process that's open-ended um, is central to this. And the more you focus on grades, and that, there's no way to grade these open-ended projects. So there's a conflict between what parents and the school system often emphasizes, grades and tests, versus this psychology and self-awareness and ability to choose for your own self what's worth making, what's good, that work against each other. So some protection of that, I think, is the thing I would think about first. Yeah. Thank you very much, Scott. Thanks, guys. Thanks, thanks for listening.